In our last video, we talked about hemolytic anemia, and we kept referencing this flowchart, which, if you remember, had production on one side, peripheral circulation in the middle, and removal on the right. And we said that imbalances in this flowchart could help us understand the mechanism behind hemolytic anemia. So what we had was an increase in removal when our production stayed the same. And this ended up with a decrease in red blood cells overall, which is why it has the name anemia. Well, in this video, we're going to be talking about the microcytic anemias, which I'll just abbreviate M lowercase i a. And here we get the same drop in red blood cells, but we get it by a different mechanism. Instead of having an increased removal, we have a change in production. And we'll go through the mechanism of this production, or this change in production, a little bit later on in this video. So what is a microcytic anemia? If you're thinking about the word, just thinking what it means, and you see this prefix here, micro, makes you think small, you'd be exactly right. Because microcytic anemias create really small red blood cells, and you can see that here on this smear. You can see that this red blood cell, which I'll outline here in red for you, right here, it has the characteristic donut shape, but the donut is a lot more open and diffuse than the regular red blood cells were that we saw earlier. You can see this rim of red is much narrower than a healthier blood cell where the inside of the donut would be much smaller. And that's because these cells are small and they look that way in the blood smear because the light passes more easily through them. In terms of a technical definition of microcytic anemia, you have to actually go ahead and measure the cells. And there's two ways that we do that. The first is a measurement called the mean corpuscular volume which I'll just abbreviate MCV, and this measures the volume of the cell in femtoliters, which is a really, really tiny amount of volume. And the second way we measure is using something called the mean corpuscular hemoglobin, which measures the amount of hemoglobin inside a red blood cell, and this is in picograms per cell. And we'll be comparing microcytic anemias, MIA, normocytic anemias, which I'll put a NA, and macrocytic anemias, which have MA lowercase a, and large uppercase A. So there are a couple of numbers to remember here. The MCV for microcytic anemias is less than 80. The normal MCV is anywhere between 80 to 99. And with macrocytic anemias, it's greater than 100. So for these three values, we're strictly talking about the volume. When we're actually talking about hemoglobin, the normal amount of hemoglobin to have per cell is somewhere between 27 and 32 picograms per cell. The microcytic anemias are anywhere less than this, so I'll say less than 26, whereas the macrocytic anemias generally have more hemoglobin than this. For the macrocytic anemia, though, the main diagnostic criteria is having an MCV greater than 100. For microcytic anemias, it's having an MCV less than 80 and an MCH less than 26. So what causes microcytic anemia? Well, there's a number of different causes, and we're going to run through a few of the main ones, but the first thing to know is kind of a more general mechanism. So I'll just write, how do you get microcytic anemias? All of the microcytic anemias have to do with problems with hemoglobin production. So I'll just abbreviate this and say bad hemoglobin. And the first one we're going to talk about is iron deficiency. So we know that iron is really important for red blood cells. In fact, it's a critical part of hemoglobin, which is represented here. And we know that each hemoglobin molecule carries four irons, which I'll represent here in orange, and these carry oxygen around to the tissues. So you can imagine, just by thinking about the fact that iron is in hemoglobin, if we don't have iron, or if we have an iron deficiency, we would get some sort of deficit in red blood cells. But first, let's talk a little bit about how it's absorbed and moved around the body. So we get all of our iron from our diet, and it's in a lot of foods, including green leafy vegetables and meat, and let's go ahead and imagine that in between these two white lines is our gut. And in here is a lot of different stuff. There's amino acids from protein breakdown, there's fats, and there's iron, which I'll draw here in orange. And iron is absorbed, and as soon as it's absorbed, it's bound to a special protein, which I'll denote with this yellow circle here, and that's called transferrin. And transferrin, the name, should be easy to remember because it has the word transfer in it. So it transfers the iron around the blood. And as soon as the iron, which I'll represent here with this orange square, bound to the transferrin, it immediately goes to the liver, to this hepatocyte, which we'll represent here in red, and we'll just label it as the hepatocyte. So this iron is floating around with the transferrin, and it comes to the liver, and instead of staying with the transferrin, the iron, which is still represented by this orange square, binds to a different protein, which we'll call ferritin. 
and that's this green triangle right here, and we'll just label this ferritin. And this is where most of the iron in our body sits. And when we have enough of it there, it actually spills out over into the blood and goes to the bone marrow, where it could be used to build more RBCs. And that's what we'll demonstrate here with this purple circle. And the iron of all places ends up in specialized macrophages, which are called nurse cells. And these nurse cells take in this iron, which I'll draw here in uh, this orange square here. But the name it takes when it's sitting in these nurse cells is called hemosiderin. So we have iron that comes in, bound to transferrin, goes to the liver where it binds to ferritin, and then it travels with ferritin to the bone marrow to these nurse cells where it's stored as hemosiderin. And the stem cells, which we talked about a couple of videos ago, sit around these nurse cells, which I'll draw here in red. And in that way, the iron that's there is available to be used by these stem cells when they're making hemoglobin. And like we talked about in a previous video, these stem cells go on to develop and differentiate, and they end up as differentiated RBCs. So you can imagine that in an iron deficiency, where the first step in this pathway is blocked, every subsequent step would have less iron. And what happens is actually that these stem cells keep dividing, and they form RBCs, but the RBCs they form are really small, because they have no hemoglobin, because there's no iron present, and since hemoglobin takes up a considerable amount of space, these RBCs are really tiny. So that's why we get the name microcytic, because the RBCs that do form are really small, hence the name microcytic. Well, how do you treat iron deficiency? Well, since the patient is going to be short of iron, the best thing you can do is actually give them iron to replace the iron that they've lost. And this comes in two ways. It comes in pill form, or it comes parenterally. And the problem with the pill form is that there's a lot of really nasty side effects. It really messes up your digestion. Parenterally, it takes a much less amount of time to restore your iron, but there's a small risk of anaphylaxis occurring. Now, iron deficiency is common in children, in pregnant women, and women who are menstruating because they lose a certain amount of blood every month. But it's not very common in uh, women who are postmenopausal or men of pretty much any age once they exit childhood. So one important thing to be aware of is that if you see an iron deficiency in an older person, a man or a woman who's postmenopausal, you have to think GI malignancy. If there's no other way for this person to be iron deficient, if they're losing blood through cancer of their GI, this is something you don't want to miss. So another way to get a microcytic anemia is something called anemia of chronic disease. So I'll just go ahead and label this number two, and I'll label this AOCD, or anemia of chronic disease. And you can think of anemia of chronic disease as basically a functional iron deficiency. So how does this work? Well, we know that we each have a daily iron requirement, and this stick figure just represents a generic person. And the problem comes when we get an infection, which I'll just make that by this bacteria right here, and this arrow going over to this person implying an infection. Now, we have our daily iron requirements, but it turns out that bacteria and fungi and other things that could infect our bodies love iron. So from the body's point of view, it wants to get rid of this iron to kind of strangle the bacteria out of a critical piece that they need for their metabolism. So we can see here, just from these nurse cells from the previous page, uh, these nurse cells in the bone marrow, they give iron to the developing RBCs. So the body, because it's under infection, secretes these cytokines, which I'll put here in green. And these cytokines come over to these nurse cells and basically shut down this pathway. And they make these nurse cells retain all their iron and prevent this hemosiderin from leaking this iron to form normal RBCs. So basically what happens is these stem cells continue to divide and form RBCs, but they're small because there's no iron to make the hemoglobin and make them normal size. So while you have iron present in the bone marrow, it's just unavailable, which makes this essentially a functional iron deficiency. In that way, it's similar to a real iron deficiency, but you have a different initial cause. The best way to treat anemia of chronic disease is just to treat the infection. Once the infection goes away, this cytokine block will be removed, and the hemosiderin will be able to supply enough iron to have normally developing RBCs. Together, anemia of chronic disease and the first one we talked about, iron deficiency, make up about 95% of the microcytic anemias, but there are other ways to get it. And the first one of these is thalassemia, which we covered in a previous video.
Just to refresh your memory, thalassemia is a deficit in production of either the alpha or the beta globin genes of hemoglobin. This makes it a quantitative hemoglobinopathy, since you have less hemoglobin being produced. This, as we talked about, creates hemolytic anemia, but it also creates a slight microcytic anemia, because we have decreased production of RBCs due to the fact that we have less normal hemoglobin being made. Don't forget that an important marker for beta thalassemia is the presence of hemoglobin A2 in the blood, in addition to hemoglobin A. Two other causes of microcytic anemia are one, heavy metal toxicity, in particular lead, which can affect the development of RBCs in the bone marrow, and lastly, what's called myelodysplastic syndrome. And there are a number of these, but the important one here is what's called sideroblastic anemia. And in sideroblastic anemia, iron is actually sequestered into the mitochondria. And since it's unavailable for hemoglobin production, it results in a microcytic anemia. So we've got down our different methods for microcytic anemia, but now the question becomes, how do you tell them apart? So we're going to be looking at four different properties, and we'll use this chart to help us out. And on the bottom of the page, we'll put our mechanism of where iron moves around in the body. So the first thing we're going to be looking at is the serum iron, which I'll label with an A. The second thing we'll look at is what's called the total iron binding capacity. Because it's actually difficult to measure directly the amount of transferrin, the TIBC essentially represents how much transferrin there is in the body. The third thing is the serum ferritin, which is how much ferritin is moving around in the body attached to iron. And the last thing is the presence of iron in the bone marrow, which I'll label with a D. So these four things, and we'll look at them in three of the diseases we talked about, iron deficiency, anemia of chronic disease, and thalassemia. So in iron deficiency, we have a lack of iron, so we would expect our serum iron to go down. Our total iron binding capacity actually goes up, because our transferrins are all empty, waiting for any potential iron that comes by. Our serum ferritin drops, because there's no iron attached to ferritin anymore, and we don't see any iron in the bone marrow because we have an iron deficiency. There's no iron to begin with. In anemia of chronic disease, all of our iron is sequestered away in the nurse cells. So we see a decrease in serum iron, but we also see a decrease in TIBC because the body is trying to hide the transferrin to prevent any infectious agents from getting access to any of the iron that's there. Our serum ferritin actually slightly increases, but that's just because of inflammation. And we do expect to see iron in the bone marrow because it's all locked up inside the nurse cells. In thalassemia, we have plenty of iron around, so our serum iron is actually going to be normal to high, while our TIBC is going to be normal. Our serum ferritin is going to be normal to high, again because we have plenty of iron available to bind with ferritin, and we're definitely going to see iron in the bone marrow because it's available, it's just not being used appropriately to make correct versions of hemoglobin. Now that we've got down the microcytic anemias, in the next video we'll take a look at the macrocytic anemias.